it's not news that the Western Cape is experiencing one of the most severe droughts in memory. And as winter approaches and the rains seem as far away as ever, everyone is getting a little more anxious about the dwindling water supply. The city of Cape Town is talking about instituting the next level of water restrictions, which are amongst the most severe and which are likely to be implemented probably within a few weeks. And there are all sorts of different solutions that have been proposed, from technological ones like uh, desalination to increasing water restrictions and other management of water in the city. And many people have pointed out that there are all sorts of ways that with water management, um, perhaps the drought could be changed or even avoided. Well, those managed to be controversial issues. And I recently met someone who has what might be considered a controversial way to help solve the problem. Controversial because it doesn't match any technologies that have been tried before and might require thinking a little bit further out of the box than many people, especially city officials, are inclined to do. But what if he has the solution? What if David Masterson's seemingly unique plan to break the drought actually works? Well, I had an opportunity to speak to David about his plan and about the fascinating principles behind it. Give it a watch, see what you think, and see if maybe you can contribute to his plan to change and break the drought. Watch. So, David, firstly, welcome here and welcome with such an interesting and I think important uh, bit of information that you'd like to share with us. Just to remind viewers that we're in Cape Town, we're suffering from an extraordinary drought, uh, the likes of which I don't know if we've seen before, but have gotten us to the point where, if we're honest about it, there doesn't really seem to be enough water left to take us even to a hopeful rain-filled winter. But I know that you've uh, been looking at solutions and you've got some interesting solutions that might be a little bit beyond what people are used to and I think that's really what we're interested in. I think we're at the point where we need innovative solutions because we sure don't have any solutions yeah. right now. Yeah. So I want to start off though just by asking you a little bit about yourself. I mean, tell us who is David Masterson? Well, thank you, Rod. It's my, thank you for having me on the show. Um, David Marston is a town planner, originally from university training. Yeah. And then in 2000, um, I decided to go and do my meditation teacher training course in Switzerland. So when you say meditation, was that a specific kind of meditation style? Or? Yes, yes. It was transcendental meditation. I'd been practicing it since 1985 and very soon, six months after that in '86. I became a Siddha, which is just the very advanced form of meditation. So an hour, an hour and a half in the morning and evening every day. And that did wonders for me in, you know, in, in kind of giving me direction and happiness and all mm -hmm. of that. We are energy beings. We're 90% energy beings and only 10% physical. But, you know, um, I think we've all gotten stuck in the physical realm just because of our mm -hmm. education, our training, our upbringing, the way society is controlled. Um, and people are still, you know, really starting to try and find out what consciousness is. And it's really the key to everything. Consciousness is primary. Matter is secondary. So uh, even even science managed to get there. It seems yes. by Einstein's time with yes. quantum mechanics. That's right. Yes. Um, so. So your background was town planning, That's not correct. science per se. When no, I town, that town planning, town a little planning. bit of architecture, right. you know, sort of city building. But what it gave me was a very big overview. Because you become gamut. very sensitive to the interdependence of all these oh, systems. So at a very young age, I already had, you know, that was being structured in my consciousness to, to look at the big picture. Um, and it kind of was also at that age that I had an interest in the environment. And I, for some reason, I guess, I've always had a very strong draw to spirituality. And, mm -hmm. um, and that is why the meditation became such an in integral part of my... My whole life has been centered around meditation and that rooted value, being rooted in that value of that ability to keep myself centered. 
Uh, otherwise, I think I would have completely have spun out, you know. <laughs> so you saw the value of it in your own life and yes. how even when you were in a regular kind of working world, yes. how that still managed to help you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So how did, how did that lead to interest in drought or rain or those kind okay, of things? Okay, in, in 1991, Maharishi released... Um, uh, well, basically what he was doing was he re-enlivened re 40 different avenues of the Vedas. Because the Vedas is incredibly difficult to understand. It contains right. 5,000 books and they're all commentaries on certain set um, topics and subjects. And, and people are muddled in all of this. Right. That's so Maharishi aside, Mahesh Yogi, yes, the founder of TM. That's right. He set aside trying to um, simplify this. So there was an avenue that explored um, architecture. That was Vastu. Then there was Jyotish, which is the Eastern astrology, and gems with it, and Yagyas, which is the remedial mm. practices, the chanting and the frequency sound value in which to bring your own being back into alignment with nature and the universe. And another avenue was Gandhava Ved, which is the eternal music of nature. It's the classical music of India, but even very much more structured than Western classical music. In amongst that was a CD called The Rain Melody, and I went like, really? I don't believe this. I mean, this has got to work. I looked at this, because I was kind of mildly aware of like yeah. this water problem in South Africa. I'd been you know, aware of it as a, as a student town planner. Um, I've got to test this. This must work. I mean, Maharishi would never you know, right. release something if it didn't work. Right. He's an enlightened master. Yeah. And I thought, and that's when it started. That was, that was like... It triggered me so profoundly that I just started testing it all over the country. Every time I went away on holiday, I would just put it on and let it play. And it's a very beautiful piece of music. It's 45 minutes long and it's, um, it's, a, it's a bamboo flute. So there's a kind of a rawness to it, mm -hmm. but it's very gentle and very beautiful. And it, what it does is it replicates the build up as in over like a whole day of how a rainstorm would develop. So it starts very slow with this mellow kind of like um, flute music mm -hmm. and builds up and gets a, then a little bit of tablas in it as you would think a, a rainstorm is building and clouds are building and then there's this crescendo when it would start raining and then a, a let off, you know, as a right. thunderstorm finishes there's that sort of ah feeling. So just know? playing the CD can influence the weather? Exactly, because what it is is that the ancient rishis, they were... In a state of enlightenment, you're able to cognize that everything in creation is just frequencies and energy. Right. We're all influenced by energy, by frequencies, at every point of the day and night. And that's both us as humans, the animals, the plants, the trees, the planets, the stars. Everything is influenced by endless frequencies bouncing off and reverberating against each other. Mm -hmm. And so we can go out of balance in, in, an, in, in an instant. And we can also come back into balance in an instant if you just know what to do. So because we are frequency beings, we can be influenced by music. And, and our emotions, what kind of type of music you choose to mm -hmm. listen to, very often resonates with the kind of emotions that you have as a person. Um, so people who like rock music are, tend to be kind of quite hard and sometimes aggressive because that's what it tends to stimulate. Mm -hmm. Classical music tends to make people very mellow and amiable and uh, accommodating of others right. because and for, for the most part it's, it's pretty pleasant music. Mm -hmm. Military brass band music gets everybody hyped and ready for aggression and war. And that's why so that's in wars they've always used trumpets and horns and brass yeah. because it's, very, it's, it's bringing out the courageousness in men. And that's a, so it's simply playing with the frequencies that we can, we, we can come to understand how something like a rain melody can influence in the environment because... So that's, but that's the frequencies affecting us yes. as living human beings. Right. Yes. For the rain, it's got to go beyond us. It's got to kind of affect nature itself. Right. Okay. Well, the, what it does is, I mean, the whole of nature is living as well, right. simply because they're not talking English to right. us. <laughs> Good <laughs> point. They're not, they're not alive. <laughs> Everything, you know, the trees, the birds, all have their own language. And, yeah. you know, the, the horse whispers and the, the dog whispers and all the rest of them confirm this for us is mm. that they, they, there's, there's a whole language out there which we are just missing because we're not tuned in enough to kind of access that. 
but really what it is is a 45 minute piece of music that goes out as an imprint a frequency imprint out into the environment and simply finds or resets resets the default setting of what nature would understand to be the methodology to create rain right. and so if you have an environment that is suddenly very dry and there's a lack of moisture everywhere and it's struggling to kind of get the hydrological cycle going as we are finding in the Western Cape what is happening is that that imprint goes out into nature and it starts stimulating everything it starts stimulating the moisture and everything and almost calling everything in because remember the sound frequencies mm. will just travel and travel and travel through space right. and so we've even found that um, in a place like Prisca which is pretty much buried in the Karoo far west of like um, you know a place like Durban mostly the cold fronts coming from Durban mm -hmm. in a southeasterly direction off the oceans and travel across the country in a sort of a northwesterly direction like that but it takes a long time to travel 1500 kilometers right. across the country to Prisco so what I'm saying then is that it took 27 days for us to create rain in Prisco we went down there in in July of last year set up the machines um, approximately 25 to 30 kilometers apart and when I say a machine at this stage is just the most basic thing I could use it's like a recording device. I mean, because yeah, we started off with CDs, so yes, it's the machine I've that... I've digitized everything into, into programs for different areas. So you get like the coastal area of South Africa that's um, mostly subtropical, or can become subtropical, but it's lush and green, and it's very close to the coast. There you only need a certain percentage of a whole 24-hour program actually playing the rain music in rain season, and within one to three days you can get rain. Okay. More inland, like in the Free State, which is the vast open territories of maize fields and very little forest or tree cover, you, it will take a, a different programming that might have 30 to 50 percent of the, the 24 hours as rain music, and it'll take five to eight days to create rain. So, literally, these machines are kind of unattended, you don't need a directly human influence. No, 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 even the rain melody. Is, is so beautiful but it, 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 it people have realized how powerful it is because when you've heard it five six seven eight right. times your head is starting it starts to affecting float. you it as well really it brings starting to bring you into balance right. and a lot of people aren't used to this um, the detox effect or the mm. the realignment effect a lot of people just run away from that you know so it's very powerful and we found in a number of different incidences worth trying people around the country that what I'm going to do is eventually when we get a professional version of the project going have a cornerstone and then simply mark out a GPS point every 30 kilometers or so based on a hypothesis of how much territory that um, sound can influence and then just lay them out across the country so it'll be a weather station a professional weather station because we lack so much professional weather collecting data in South Africa driven by a solar system mm -hmm. that's very simple I've got one at home and then we've built a prototype our third version of a prototype sound machine that is also driven by solar and yeah. so, it, so it can sit there, it can sit there out in in the bush and just do its thing and not affect people or disturb them because the the rain melody is probably um, the least offensive of all the, <laughs> the music types you right. know if you if anybody's familiar with um, classical Indian music right. there's a lot of instruments that we're not familiar with yes the and the harmonic scale is a little bit different it's very different yes um so so it sounds fascinating <clears throat> has it been tested I mean have you actually set up machines somewhere that you can leave like that well look we've done I've done I've run five um, trials on my own out of pocket out of uh, my own money they sort of hick little local um, programs the, the problem is that I've been to ARC which is the Agricultural Research Council in Pretoria spoken to the particular division that deals with climate change and climate research they still confounded about how to create an experiment that would links the sound frequencies and the um, 
resultant effect which is the creation of rain and having rainfall. They're basically saying to me, look, you need two laboratory created tanks which can create an atmosphere which, you know, is, is enough of a, 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 a mind... Uh, yes. And there's a whole other <laughs> science getting thing. involved. Anyway. Yes, yes, you know, and you have one tank that doesn't have music and another one that does and and you've got to test it for 10 years and that'll probably cost 10 to 20 million rand blah 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 all that n normal standard scientific nonsense mm -hmm. meanwhile here we're simply taking an indigenous tool or technique that was used five ten thousand years ago on a regular basis to just simply play um, ever so often when it was needed when there was drought, because they understood, they, they just understood the frequencies. The rishis understood the frequencies and can translate that into musical tones right. and give it to the musicians. Well, I mean, as I've experienced it, a lot of that Vedic culture is about using sound and resonance. I mean, Absolutely. you mentioned yagas, which are important in Vedic astrology to yes. change difficult patterns. Yes. But even more basic that everyone's got access to, and people often use without realizing, is chanting and mantras. Yes. yes. So in yoga studios everywhere mm -hmm. and all of those kind of things. Absolutely. And I myself have used mantras definitely to affect change in my own life pretty easy, quickly, and obviously. Right. And it seems to me that there's a core idea in Vedic culture that um, vibration basically created the world. Yes. So well, this, a vibration of sound even yes. created the world, which I think does exist in Western culture. Yeah, even in the Bible, the Bible starts within the beginning, you know, the word was with God and was God and is God. So God speaks in order God to create speaks. the world. Speech and language yeah. and music, anything to do with the vibration that can come out of the mouth or an instrument is frequency and vibration. That yeah. created the world, that created the cosmos. We are vibrational beings, even if you can't see the vibrations, you know, we, we're physical entities that feel that we're separate from each other mm. and from things around us. But essentially, the quantum physicists are all saying everything is frequency and energy. And we can influence ourselves through the right kinds of sounds and chanting and mantras. And there are also other things that can take us away in the wrong direction. So, so quantum physicists are responsive to these ideas? Oh yes, they are. They are. But it's very hard to find them. And most of them are, you know, in the research labs, right. just, you know, at the cutting edge of their own fields. They're not the decision makers out there in society that are assisting with funding or, um, you know, business angels or philanthropists. Yeah. Um, they need a different kind of explanation. Um, and, and so, yes, they do understand. Quantum physicists really do understand the whole concept here is that it's very easy to influence the environment with something like this. And it's quite ironic that we've had 40 different cultures around the world um, there's been the Slovakian cultures, a lot of the East European cultures, Middle mm. Eastern, the Jewish people also had a rain dance. Mm. Um, you've got the Red Indians. Many of those tribes had their own rain-making techniques and sing-songs and festivals and rituals that they practiced in order to bring rain. The Mayans had it. Of course, the Aborigines, the Maoris in Australia had it. And most of our African cultures have it. Um, you know, um, but you talk to a white scientist and it's like, oh no, we, we, it's still not good enough because we didn't have it. We didn't have it, so <laughs> you've got to give me a scientific answer, yeah. you know, answer on this too. In the, in the trials that I've done, let me just explain two trials that I've done. Mm -hmm. I got 15 friends in Joburg, all spaced apart as best I could to take, get a little machine, little mini hi-fi, mm -hmm. with just, uh, we worked in an MP3 player just with the rain melody on it, and 15 people in Pretoria, and I said, go, just put it in a room that you don't use and play it out the window, softly. It's not, doesn't have to be, yeah. we're, not, we're not disturbing the neighbors or creating rock <laughs> concerts here. It's just, you know, normal TV volume or speaking volume. And when, within 10 days, we had it bucketing down in Joburg for four days. Wow. I, in my place in Joburg, had 636 millimeters of rain wow. from that point in time until the end of March, when wow. they said it would only start raining. 
And pretty much every single season that I've lived in Johannesburg since 2002 has had a normal stock standard rainfall of five to six to seven hundred millimeters because I'm there with my machines. I just and want to ask you this. If someone watching this is, yes. is decided I'm going to do this yes. and got hold of you or your machine or a CD yes. and started doing it, just one person on their own somewhere in Cape Town, would there be any result? Um, it depends. There, uh, quite a number of people have picked up the rain melody and, and are doubtful. And so they play it and say, okay, well, now you've got to show me. It's almost like that's their, their attitude to the universe. Mm. And invariably, they get a, a sort of a mediocre result which, in which they can't really tell whether it was or wasn't. Right. Um, the other thing that we found through the, the trials is that we had two machines that were eight kilometers apart. And we had three days in February and March each which had over 101 millimeters of hmm. rain in a 24-hour period for Joburg. That's freaky. I mean, the yeah. the Yuxke River was coming down in absolute flood and a couple of shacks got taken away. And I suddenly thought, wait a minute, I think I think I know what's going on here. One of the, We're too close with some of the machines. My original hypothesis was 25 kilometers because that's the eye to the horizon basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in the Karoo I've tested that you can get 360 degrees of complete cloud cover with one machine that's how powerful this is wow. so it's it's not uh, going to what I'm saying is that it's not going to work on the basis of anybody who's interested can just get a machine because in farming areas you get farmers that are clumped together right, so it's still going to be properly it's got to be properly just years yeah. because you we can, you can create such intense floods mm. we, we we've become arrogant as human beings and we think that we're here to control mother nature we can and we will um, and i'm saying we need to become more mature now we we we've, mm. we've done so much damage rape and plunder with our mining and our oil digging. Time to and, take and, a step um, back and realize we have the damage. All of this, yeah. Yeah. Yes, so I know that you've tried to interest the city of Cape Town yes. in funding or helping fund some trials. Right. And you've met with the usual stone wall yeah. that one gets from city bureaucracies at the best of times. Yes. Um, I was wondering though if perhaps the fact that it's connected to a, a culture or a religion or something like that might be what bothers uh, potential funders. Yes, I think I think that is that that I will admit is out there. Um, that is going to happen, and but I think in future years we're going to find more and more of a number of things coming to the fore. There's going to be so many new technologies mm. that are going to come into existence, even within the next ten years. That I think that things that come from indigenous cultures, you know, so. Um, and I think people are opening up more and more to consciousness and to meditation and certainly yoga has had a big influence in the last, mm, um, that's true. The last decade. Um, but maybe part of the lesson for us is that we need to go beyond people like city bureaucracies who yeah. are the epitome of vested interests right. yes. and get other people more interested, people who've got a bigger vision yes. than any city typically yeah. has. So hopefully... Yeah. Um, we can we can do that by some people are being exposed to your ideas right now hearing this. Yeah. So I know that you are trying to um, raise funds and encourage people to contribute to the trials and the development right. of yes. networks of machines. Yes. So um, is there some way they can contact you that will help you? Then yes, they show can the interest. Right, they can go to the Facebook page and have a look at Weather Balance Technology. Mm -hmm. They can contact me. I think probably they can contact me either by email at weatherbalance at gmail dot com or on my cell phone number zero seven two one nine two eight four eight seven. Let me put you kind of on the line. Right. Do you sincerely believe that if Cape Town and presumably other places adopted this this beautiful mi uh, syn uh, synergy of a kind of a spiritual technology and a regular yes. material technology that we would solve our drought problem oh yes absolutely 100 percent 
Well, it might sound a little bit unusual to some people, but I think we're at the stage where we've got nothing to lose. So it's definitely worth contributing to. And if you feel that you can contribute to David's work, please do give him a shout on those numbers he provided. Of course, you should also visit the show Rod Suskin's World on Facebook, where you can follow us, you can watch shows again, you can see what's coming up, and you can enter competitions. So don't forget to go and like the page on Facebook right now, just as soon as you finished watching this. So, hope to see you there. And of course, next week we're back with another month ahead. They do just fly by, and as the world gets more interesting, so do the months ahead. So be sure to watch next Friday. See you right here.